Well, thank you for joining us. Um, this morning, we are here to chat about two ballot measures, uh, Measure J and Prop 15, and how they're going to affect the nonprofit sector if they pass. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping and introduce our speakers. Uh, we're joined by Julio Marcial of the Liberty Hill Foundation, um, as well as Veronica Carzales of California Calls. Um, they're each going to be speaking about a different measure today. Um, very pleased to have them here, and Regina will do a little more introductions in just a second. Um, wanted to make clear some of the resources that we've got available for nonprofits at your disposal, including uh, free 15-minute office hours appointments with any of our expert consultants, um, as well as our packed calendar of educational programming. We just announced all of our courses for November, um, so we got a pretty full calendar ready for you. Um, also, a couple of great scholarship opportunities for free technical assistance and capacity building services. Um, we're partnering in a couple of different programs, both with the nonprofit partnership and with First Five um, for two different scholarship programs, um, one for Riverside County organizations and then one for any organization serving in Best Five's, uh, uh, sorry, First Five's Best Start region. Um, you can check out both of those on our blog at cnmsocal.org slash blog. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got a couple of great opportunities coming up. Um, at the end of uh, is that next week, yeah, lost all track of time. Next week is a leading a change with emotional intelligence, and that is just about full, but I think we got a couple of seats left. Um, and then starting early in November, we've got a remote working fundamental seminar and a certificate program on creating inclusive and equitable cultures. Um, all of those are on our website as well. Um, and then just a couple of norms for this morning. You know, this is a free exchange of information. Please be respectful of everyone. Um, you're welcome to speak freely and candidly. This is definitely a discussion and we'll have um, a lot of time for Q&A, but we are recording this to share with others. So just be mindful um, and take care of yourself. You know, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, welcome to unmute yourself to ask questions. We'd love to see your faces on video, but definitely not required. Um, and other than that, just, you know, keep an open mind and excited for this conversation. Um, kick it over to Regina. I wanna introduce our speakers today. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, hello, everybody. Happy Friday morning. I was smiling, Aaron, because we're counting down. Aaron's about to become a dad in about two <laughs> weeks. So um, a lot of these programs are going to happen while you're home and sleep deprived. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be thinking of you. So um, anyway, good morning, everybody. And um, I don't want to spend too much time on anything other than to say that we know right now that there are so many important opportunities happening in LA County, happening in California that are real opportunities for the nonprofit sector to get some funding um, to deliver on services to really drive change in communities that have been left behind. So um, we thought it was important to um, spend some time on two uh, issues and to make sure that you guys have a chance to ask questions, find out what it could mean if they pass next year for the nonprofit sector, um, and to help kind of sort through some of the misinformation that's going on. So we um, invited two friends um, that can be great resources for you. So we're gonna start with Veronica, who's gonna talk about Prop 15. Thank you so much, Veronica, for being here today. And for you guys that are on this Zoom session, um, take advantage of the chat, but we'll also make sure we leave time for conversation. So this is about you. So uh, feel free to step in if you have questions. Veronica, go for it. Great. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Give me a second. And if somebody could just give me a thumbs up and, and let me know whether or not you can see my screen, that would be great. Uh, I also want to make sure there's no block because of a, oops, just, there's no block in the front, right? Okay, nope, you're all good. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, I heard it was a, a, a breakfast get together. So I have my, my tea here with me. Um, my name is Veronica Carizales. I'm the policy director for California Calls, which is a, a, a nonprofit statewide alliance of community-based um, organizations. And I'm, I'm here to talk to you about Proposition 15. Um, so, you know, most of us want similar things. We want good schools for our children, a healthy family, and safe neighborhoods. Um, unfortunately, California has fallen behind in adequately funding our schools and communities. Uh, California is currently ranked 39th in per pupil funding and ranked dead last in the number of nurses, counselors, and librarians per student. 
42 years of systemic disinvestment has hit communities of color the hardest. Black and Latino students suffer the most from lack of funding for schools and community colleges, which are typically gateways for people to have career paths, livable wages, and good jobs. So, so who has been benefiting? What was sold to us as protecting grandmother's house instead became a huge tax giveaway for large corporations like Chevron, Blackstone, and golf courses, uh, and Disneyland um, at a cost to everyone else. Because when large corporations don't pay their fair share, the rest of us end up paying in higher fees, in bond measures, in parcel taxes, while our local governments try to fill the gap. Wealthy commercial property investors and multi-billion dollar corporations are utilizing highly paid tax lawyers to exploit loopholes and avoid paying their fair share. Proposition 15 addresses the fundamental problem in our current system by requiring that commercial and industrial properties valued over 3 million be regularly reassessed based on their fair market value. Every other state in the nation does this and there's no reason why California cannot do the same. Proposition 15 reclaims $12 billion each year to invest in schools, community colleges, and, and local services. 92% of the revenue comes from 10% of the biggest, wealthiest corporations who have benefited for 42 years from the loopholes. So where does the money go? Um, you know, the, it, and this, is, this is important. Um, the money from uh, the $12 billion uh, from uh, Prop 15, about 40% of it will go to uh, K through 12 schools and community colleges. Uh, you can see here the division between K through 12 schools and community colleges. Um, the money will go to pay for uh, critical services that we need um, at the schools like school nurses, counselors, librarians, smaller class sizes. The measure includes an equity formula so that schools with the greatest needs get additional funding. Um, this is critical, right, because ESL students were already falling behind before the pandemic. And now without access to stable internet or without access to many of the resources that schools provide, we really are asking kids to do more and less. Uh, Proposition 15 is targeted, um, the funding is targeted through the local control funding formula. It's distributed through this formula. So what this means is that school districts with high proportions of kids on the free lunch program, which is an indicator of poverty, the ESL program, or in the foster care program, will get additional funding. Proposition 15 invest in our communities, about 60% uh, of the revenue will go to local government. So that's counties, cities, and special districts. Um, as we know, the, they pay for critical services like libraries, fire districts, affordable housing, senior services, and county public health programs. Proposition 15 provides a lifeline to local governments that are facing unprecedented budget cuts. Uh, I just want to make it clear that uh, Proposition 15 will not impact any residential property whatsoever. So it doesn't impact homeowners and it doesn't impact renters. Anything that's used as residential property is completely exempt. This includes mobile homes. This includes uh, senior, um, senior living facilities, condos. Um, it includes hotels that have been converted into housing for the homeless. Anything that is used as residential property is completely exempt from Proposition 15. Proposition 15 also exempts uh, agriculture. Uh, it explicitly makes no changes to laws affecting the taxation and preservation of agricultural land or any commercial agriculture. Throughout the measure, both in the intent and the statute, agricultural and commercial agricultural property is completely exempt means it will be treated the way it currently is treated. Um, and I'm proud to say that we have uh, the support from uh, the California uh, Small Far uh, Farmers Association uh, which, uh, and CAF, which is the, the largest small farmers association in the state of California. Um, just to uh, give a little bit more detail, uh, not only do we exempt agriculture, uh, we also provide um, agriculture with a tax break and new tax relief. Uh, we implement a 500,000 exemption 
for biz, for all businesses under the business personal property tax. Uh, this is a tax that businesses have to pay for business equipment and fixtures. So farmers have to pay this tax for tractors, above ground irrigation systems and more. Um, and then for uh, small businesses with 50 employees or less, we fully exempt them from this tax. Um, again, uh, Proposition 15 provides the single largest tax break uh, for small businesses. A recent report from Beacon Economics uh, shows that uh, small businesses, even businesses with triple net leases, will not be negatively impacted by Proposition 15, and in fact, will we'll, uh, see a tax break and will benefit from Proposition 15. You know, uh, many people uh, don't know this, but property tax revenue is collected locally and it stays locally, right? So this is local revenue. We have local control. Um, you know, this allows communities to make plans locally to address the needs. This is stable revenue. Uh, property tax revenue has always been stable revenue. Um, unlike um, the state budget, which swings with the stock market or with income tax increases. Um, and the, the good thing about having local control is that it allows um, priorities from community from community to be set. So what Alameda, Alameda County may need will be widely different from what's needed in Inyo County. You can see here uh, from, um, from this breakdown that every county in the state of California will see a net benefit from Proposition 15. In Los Angeles, we're expected to gain $3.75 billion in revenue. And this is annual revenue to the County of Los Angeles, which will be divided between schools, counties, cities, and special districts. Um, Proposition 15 ensures accountability and transparency. It's written right into the law in plain language. And it's a requirement that all revenue generated must be spent and must be accounted for um, in easily understandable language. Um, I want to address some of the misinformation. Um, our opposition, which is led uh, by some of the largest corporations in the state of California um, and uh, led by the California Business Roundtable, uh, the California Chamber of Commerce, um, they've been running a campaign of deception. They've been running commercials and ads with misinformation. Um, and really preying on the fears of low-income people, saying that we're going after residential next, saying that we're going to wipe out small businesses. And it's just simply not true. Um, what we know is that uh, these large corporations are trying to divide our communities and they're willing to say anything that they can to protect their profits. They're not looking out for the interest of our communities. They're looking out for the interest of their profits. We have a broad uh, and powerful coalition uh, that came behind this measure. This measure actually started as a grassroots effort. So community-based uh, organizations uh, across the state collected 1.7 million signatures to place this measure on the ballot. But we have um, organizations, we have over 1,500 endorsements from a di diverse groups of organizations like the California PTA, the Fresno Black Chamber of Commerce, ACLU here in Los Angeles, Community Coalition, the Los Angeles Black Workers Center, Cal Nonprofits. We have strong support from labor like the California Professional Firefighters, SCIU and CTA, statewide leaders like Governor Newsom, Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris, and Congresswoman Karen Bass. Uh, and locally, we have the support of Mayor Garcetti, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, LAUSD School Board, and the Los Angeles City Council. We cannot afford not to pass Proposition 15. It's a critical component of California's recovery and reinvestment that will provide critical funding to our schools and our communities. Um, I just wanted to share some information for how to get involved. Um, you can go to yes15.org. You can also text our future to 97779 to get updates. Um, this is going to be a close election. Uh, the opposition is spending millions and millions of dollars to defeat our measure. Uh, every vote counts and we need your help. Um, if uh, any of you want to get involved, there's lots of opportunities to do phone banking. We have phone banking that's happening every evening. Um, and you can go to sef.vote slash phone. Um, 
slash phone bank uh, and get involved uh, in doing phone banking um, on, a, on a regular basis. Uh, if you can't do phone banking, just talk to your friends, just talk to your neighbors about Proposition 15. This is an election of our lifetime. We need to get involved. Thank you. So Veronica, thank you for that. And I'm curious if, if it's successful and um, it's 2021, what will those dollar, how will the nonprofit sector be impacted by that infusion of cash? Because that's a significant amount of money. So what does that mean for the nonprofit sector? Yeah, so um, I work in the nonprofit sector. I work for a nonprofit organization and uh, we work with many low-income communities across the state of California. Um, additional funding means that there's there's additional uh, funding for partnerships with not with local governments, right? I know uh, many organizations have partnerships with local governments to provide housing, to provide food to low-income families, um, and so additional funding for local governments means that nonprofits uh, can partner with these with these local governments to carry out some of these programs. I think more importantly, um, many of us got into the nonprofit sector because we wanted to help other people, right? We wanted to help our communities um, and uh, additional funding for schools and for those critical local services that I mentioned, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, firefighters, uh, libraries, parks, are critical for our communities. Um, and I think uh, all of us, right, uh, want to see uh, all boats lifted, right? And, and that's what Proposition 15 does. Thank you. Muted yourself there, Regina. Oh, sorry. Um, I keep doing that so that I don't have all this background noise. Um, so Julio, let's talk about Jay and how much has happened over the summer based on activism and where the opportunities are going forward. Just try to clarify what it's about and where we're headed. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm Julio Marcion, the Vice President of Partnerships for the Liberty Hill Foundation, and we're also uh, one of the steering committee members for Measure J. Uh, we often say Measure J stands for justice. Um, Measure J, just to kind of give you the, the background on it, um, what a yes vote, what a no vote means. It, Measure J is a charter amendment. It's been put on the ballot by the Board of Supervisors, four supervisors, uh, put forward a board motion um, that was approved uh, and was sent um, and added to the, the to the local county ballot. So what is a yes vote? Um, it basically amends the county's charter to require that no less than 10% of the county's general fund be appropriated to community programs uh, and an alternative to incarceration such as health services and other programs that many of you are all uh, doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It also authorizes the Board of Supervisors to develop a process on how to allocate those funds. Uh, and as a matter of fact, just yesterday, the Board of Supervisors uh, put forward a board motion that if in fact Measure J passes, um, there will be a uh, community process to include uh, folks that are directly impacted on that steering committee on how those monies are allocated. Uh, it will also allow the Board of Supervisors to reduce the amount allocated with a vote of four to one during a declared fiscal emergency. So there is some flexibility uh, in this ballot initiative as well. A no vote, opposes amending the county's charter flat out. A, a no vote means we don't want to change anything. We want to keep the status quo. And let me just share with you a little bit of what is happening behind the scenes. So, you know, I often talk about the um, LA is, you know, it's where I was born and raised, but unfortunately we were number one and we still are number one for all the wrong reasons. We arrest, incarcerate, prosecute more black, brown, native indigenous folks than anywhere else in this country. Um, we have an annual uh, budget uh, allocated to the Sheriff's Department that equals $3.3 billion. So just to be clear, they're not losing that $3.3 billion. They, they're going to get it every single year. What this measure does, it really aligns with what the community has been working on for several years now. And so the county is in the midst of a, a very historic shift, right? They rejected the construction of new jails being built. They're really embracing an, an innovative alternative to incarceration program, um, which has actually resulted from collaboration amongst county officials, uh, nonprofit service providers, many of you on this call, uh, as well as community activists and organizers and, and representatives. And so for us, um, sustaining this new policy direction will take money, right? Some comes from the remaining funds that have been set aside for the new jails, but that won't be nearly enough. And if the county is to fund a community-based care first approach to public safety without raising taxes, 
the board will have to allocate a greater share of its existing funds to those programs that it currently does. And it's just, you know, this is no secret, right? We know that the county budget is $35 billion a year, but a lot of that revenue is encumbered by state and federal mandates. The board's discretion over locally generated funds is rather small in the millions, definitely not the billions. And the lion's share of that money tends to go to interests that have the resources and the expertise to lobby or dissuade supervisors. Guess who those folks are, right? Those interests include the unions that represent the sheriff's deputies, probation officers, uh, criminal prosecutors, and others in law enforcement. Uh, you know, folks say they have every right to organize and fight for better paying working conditions. But let's not forget that they also fight for ever larger shares of the county budget. And so we know for four decades now, uh, many have uh, seen the explosion and the increase in the budgets for the sheriff's district attorneys and other similar groups um, in pursuit of a vision of public safety based on what they know, arrest, trial, and jail. Whereas, you know, we believe nonprofit health and social service groups can more than match them in the passion and the vision, but they lack the resources to compete when county budgets allocate money. And so Me Measure J hardly even evens the field. It doesn't even the playing field at all. I just shared with you that the LA County uh, Sheriff Department will continue to receive its $3.3 billion budget allocation every single year. But what Measure J does, it makes it a bit less slanted by ensuring that at least one of every 10 unencumbered locally generally dollars is invested in services geared toward treatment, economic development, rather than law enforcement and punishment. So again, you'll see commercials uh, come out, you know, the opposition, which again is, is underwriting, um, is, is the district attorney and the sheriff's department. They are concerned that, you know, in years past when there was um, uh, increases in, in budgets, those monies were allocated and backfilling sheriff department budgets uh, for projects that they saw were important. So the 10% of this unrestricted general funds could be appropriated for youth development programs, job training, uh, investment in small uh, businesses owned by black, brown, native indigenous folks. Uh, it could be used for rental assistance, housing vouchers, transitional housing, and specifically as it relates to the work to alternatives to incarceration. You'll hear that quite a bit, because again, there's been a significant movement and a significant transformation taking place in the county these funds could be allocated to support community-based restorative justice programs, health services, counseling, mental health. Um, we know way too many uh, individuals that are in these systems who are there because of mental health and, and significant trauma. We believe those, those individuals, whether they're young people or adults, should be served in the community. But the nonprofit sector needs a fair chance to be able to compete. And public dollars uh, obviously are much difficult to come by. And so Measure J, like I said, does not even the playing field, but it gives nonprofits an opportunity to be able to deliver their services using public dollars. So that's in a nutshell what Measure J is. We're really excited. We believe um, we have an opportunity to win, but we're, we're being outspent, right? So we don't have the two, four, five million dollar budget to put out every single commercial like the uh, you know, district attorney and the sheriff's department will do in the next few weeks. So we're really, you know, doing this grassroots. We're using every social media platform. We're having every type of conversation you can imagine, trying to get the word out, do, you know, a lot of out education and outreach to our fellow network members. And I encourage all of you, if you all uh, believe that nonprofits you know, deserve a fair chance um, to access uh, public money, we ask that you join a hundred other organizations who've co-signed onto Measure J um, many of whom may be on this call, but just really want to thank you all for the time and not the opportunity. Um, we have a window here. Um, this may not come uh, again for a very long time, and that's part of why this measure was accelerated over the last 60 days. Uh, this is normally a campaign that you would do over a three to five year process, but because of the pandemic and because of the murder of George Floyd, uh, things have been accelerated, and, and rightfully so. So thank you again, Regina and Aaron, for this opportunity. And more than happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks, Julio. So I'm curious, um, in both cases, Veronica and Julio, I'm curious if this becomes, are these count ultimately, if we just, aside from the fact that there'll be money for social services for programs on the ground, clearly, um, would these be county contracts that organizations would be able to go after in, early 2021 to start to deliver these services? How would that work? 
do you want to start, Veronica, or shall I jump in? Go ahead, Julio, and then I'll jump, and then I'll go in. So Regina, that's a great question. And as it relates to Measure J, um, it is a phased approach. So the amendment would become effective on July 1, 2021, and, the, and implement the 10% allocation over three years with the full set aside in effect by June 30th of 2014. To your point on how do you get this money out? That is one of the big question marks that I think all of us are, are trying to figure out. And as I mentioned, just this week, uh, actually just last night, and I'm more than happy to share this in the chat, the LA County Board of Supervisors, um, uh, Sheila Kuehl's office in partnership with Mark Ridley Thomas's office put forward a motion to really put together a committee uh, that would actually answer a lot of these questions. So one, it's one thing to win at the ballot box, but then how do we get it out when we're using the same draconian broken contracting system that has inhibited many nonprofits to access these public resources? And I know the center has done an amazing job to elucidate and highlight the need to not reform, but to transform the contracting system. And so I think, Regina, this accelerates that conversation even more so. And that's where we need all hands on deck as well. So this is a motion that is probably not going to get a lot of attention related to contracting, but we need people to voice their frustrations about how complicated and impossible it is to access public dollars with an existing contracting system. So it's one thing to win, but it's another thing is how it's going to be implemented. So I encourage all of you to participate and to voice your direct experience uh, in this conversation. And again, I'll put that motion in the in the chat in a second. Great, uh, thank you, Julio. And just to address how Proposition 15, how the revenue works with that. Uh, so uh, given that we we're making a, a dramatic change, right? Uh, it's been 42 years, uh, and we're asking. Um, county assessors to regularly reassess uh, commercial industrial properties. Uh, uh, given that it's it's a major change, what we're going to be doing is we're we're allowing for a two year ramp up, and so the first lien date isn't until January 2022. Um, so the revenue wouldn't start coming in until 2022 2023. So there's a two year ramp up uh, that allows uh, that provides funding uh, to each of the counties so that uh, they could. Uh, hire the staff that's necessary to start doing the reassessments. Uh, but the, the first year that the revenue uh, would come in wouldn't be until then. Um, now, uh, we've always seen this as a two-step process, right? The first step is let's get the revenue back uh, to our local communities. Let's get the revenue back to our schools and our local governments. And then the second step is let's make sure that the revenue is going to those critical services that we want it to be going, right? I know we've heard a lot of concerns, um, especially in, um, in communities of color about uh, the revenue going to fund the police, right? And so we wanna make sure that the revenue is going to fund critical services uh, that we all depend on. Um, I know many nonprofit organizations um, have contracts with local governments uh, to provide um, programs for the elderly, uh, for low-income people, for around homelessness, around health clinics. And so I think once the revenue is, is coming to these local governments, it allows for uh, nonprofit organizations that have contracts uh, with local governments, um, you know, to advocate, right, for these critical services that we want funded in our communities. So it sounds like one of the takeaways from both of you is that if you have relationships with uh, supervisor staff or city staff, that you should be talking early and often about what you think, um, how these dollars can be used and how involved you want to be, because it seems that this is the time, right? Well, de it definitely is. I mean, you know, as, as part of the Prop 15 campaign, we've set up a a statewide uh, structure with um, with regional coalitions. Um, and again, the plan is once we pass the measure, once we win the measure, to then start to do organizing at the local level with these regional coalitions to start advocating uh, for the revenue to go to critical services that we care about, uh, mental health and other critical services that have been mentioned, the arts. Um, and so I think that, um, it, you know, once the money comes to the local level, we have to be ready uh, and even before then, right, uh, start advocating for the programs that we care about to ensure that the funding will go there. It's so much easier to get these programs funded when there's revenue on the table than when there isn't revenue on the table, right? So now they can't tell us there's no money to pay for X, Y, and Z because the revenue will be there. Uh, and so now it's a discussion about what are the priorities 
And so I think what we need to be thinking about is how do we make it clear to local governments that these are the priorities, that these, these set of critical services are the priorities for our communities and that, and that their constituencies want to see those priorities funded. And so I think that's part of the thinking that, that needs to happen in the next uh, couple of years before the revenue starts coming. And the advocacy has to happen before the revenue gets here, I think. <laughs> so. Well, I wasn't sure if there are any questions. We have a small enough group that if you guys have any questions, just unmute yourself. I have lots of questions. <laughs> I have a, I have a question. Good, mo good morning, Julio. Good morning, Veronica. Uh, do, do we have an idea where these measures stand right now in, in the polls? Do, do you want to go, Julio? You want me to go? You can go. Okay, great. Um, so there was a, a PPIC poll that actually just came out this week, um, and that poll has this polling at 49%. Um, I want to make two points about um, statewide measures. For a statewide measure, you need 50% 50, 50 plus one vote to win. That's all you need to win. It's not two-thirds uh, uh, vote like you have at the local government uh, level. Um, the other point I want to make is that the PPIC poll polls likely voters. So they poll voters that turned out to vote um, in the last gubernatorial election and the last presidential election. Many times they're not polling voters in our communities, which are uh, low income, immigrant, young voters. Uh, in our internal polling, we're, we're polling above 50%. But let's take that 49% number. So 49% polling from PPIC. We have a statewide field program that is calling voters every night. And our goal through our field program is to turn out 550,000 voters statewide. Um, our goal is to, uh, as part of the field, to uh, close the margin of victory by three to 5%. So right now, and we just started our, our, our phone program, we're already at one point uh, one and a half percent. So the field is actually going to close that gap. Um, and we've always seen field as our secret weapon. Um, you know, as California calls, we regularly do phone, uh, phone programs um, and, uh, and get out the vote efforts because we want to make sure that the low income communities that we represent are turning out to vote. And what we're hearing on the phones, we're seeing a lot of excitement from young voters. Um, many of the people making the calls every night are people between the ages of 18 and 25. They're so excited about this measure and they really wanna see it win. And it's really a lot of their energy that's making the rest of us really excited about it. But we're seeing a lot of strong support from the Latino community, from the African-American community. Um, and we're seeing a lot of strong support statewide for the measure. So um, going into this, I'm feeling Feeling pretty good. Um, of course, I, I knock on wood, I don't want to jinx anything, but we, we're feeling really good going into this, uh, but it will be a close race. And so uh, I'm asking all of you to please turn out to vote and please make sure you're talking to your friends and family about the measures on the ballot. Yeah, thank you. Veronica, uh, same thing, you know, I think, you know, unfortunately, we don't have, you know, Measure J is not connected to any of the statewide polling uh, centers that you often get to reference. So a lot of the polling that that we're seeing uh, is obviously locally based and, and it fluctuates. And I think, you know, if you would ask me about a month ago, you know, we were probably neck and neck. Uh, we're still probably neck and neck, honestly. I think they, obviously the opposition has an, an advantage because they have a much larger um, campaign to put out commercials and to distort what Measure J is. You know, people will will use the word defund police. This does nothing to take any money away from law enforcement at all. This is discretionary funding that the board has every single year. And in years past, it would backfill budgets to the DA, the courts, um, the sheriff's department. Again, they they will continue to receive their three point three billion dollar budget to police Los Angeles County. So. You know, we, we shall see. I, I uh, you know, I'm hopeful, um, but we have to. It, this is a, a, a ground game, grassroots campaign. Um, it started very late. You know, Veronica, when did you start? You know, when was the Prop 15 campaign? When did you guys start? Can't, can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry about that. 
Uh, we started five years ago. Five years ago. Okay. Measure J, the campaign for Measure J started in July. So, you know, that just tells you the uphill battle we have, but we believe we have political support, the public support, but we also need your help. And I, I can't, you know, if you believe in, in fairness and believe that, that nonprofits have an ability to provide services in the county of Los Angeles, this is a revenue source that can help. Um, and hopefully we, at the same time, we can start to work to undo this really, you know, harmful contracting system. But yeah, I would say it's going to be a, a photo finish and we're not taking anything lightly. So every day matters. You know, I encourage people uh, to encourage your followers to vote now. Do not wait three days before November 3rd to mail your vote in. Uh, that is too late. Get people to, you know, send their ballots in now. Um, so that way, at least we have a, a fair chance. But yeah, so I think that's where we're at. We don't have any, uh, we'll probably get a, a new poll probably sometime later in the week. But at this point, it's neck and neck. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I always um, appreciate the idea that we have 250,000 people working in the nonprofit sector in LA County. Those are all voters that are going to end up doing this work, whether these things pass or not. <laughs> you know, um, all of the burdens uh, are going to be on the nonprofit sector to support these communities. And what a time to, you know, draw attention to these issues and these opportunities. These are public dollars that we could access. Um, and then next year we'll tackle how to get those contracts fixed. Uh, we're gonna be working hard on that as you guys all know. Um, if there are any other questions, I wanna make sure that we have this chance um, while we have our experts with us. And I also know that um, they all have lots to do and so do you. So. Um, if there aren't any other questions, Aaron, I can't tell. We seeing any hands up? Um, yeah, I just have one follow-up question again as well. Um, so, Veronica, a lot of things we are hearing from our youth is that their parents are really scared to vote for um, for Measure 15. Quite honestly, we we end up having to uh, support their conversations that they having with their parents um, for uh, you know for many reasons, but they think that that's going to be uh, kind of a hit to them as as really small homeowners. Uh, so I feel like maybe we need better tools to have these conversations in a quicker rate, because I know uh, just last Monday, we had a conversation with a few of our youth when we were going through the measures and they and almost unanimously their parents uh, had voice to them that they were scared to vote yes on 15. So how how are we missing that opportunity in conversation? I, I actually wasn't even aware that these conversations, it seemed like a no brainer. And I was really taken aback when I heard that from our youth. Yeah, um, and part of what's happened is that um, the op, and I mentioned earlier, the opposition has been running a campaign of deception and they're really preying on people's fears, right? They know we have a housing crisis in California. They know that uh, people are, are having a hard time making ends meet uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, people are worried about mortgage payments. People are worried about uh, paying for the rent. And so what they're doing is they're, they're specifically targeting our communities, the Latino, Black, API, low-income communities. They're trying to divide our communities and they're using scare tactics to tap into that fear. Uh, um, and uh, it, it really is just complete lies what they've been saying. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's such a ho horrible precedent, right, uh, to be doing that. Um, what we've been doing to try to combat that, that, uh, that misinformation that they're spreading is uh, um, specifically here in Los Angeles, we've been, we have ads that are going up in radio and television. Um, we have uh, mailers that we've been sending out in, um, in multiple languages. Um, we're also trying to get our um, elected officials to uh, stand up and uh, speak out in favor of Proposition 15 and talk about uh, what the impacts have been. Dolores Huerta has been great. She's been doing a number of um, videos. We, um, she's, uh, we also have the support of La Opinion. So uh, we recently uh, got an endorsement from La Opinion. As you know, we have an endorsement from the Los Angeles Times. Um, and just this week, we got an endorsement from the Sacramento Bee. Uh, but um, 
having uh, the endorsement from La Opinion is critical for um, our, uh, you know, Latino voters uh, here in the Los Angeles area. We're trying to get to voters in, in multiple ways, whether it's print ads, whether it's radio, uh, whether it's videos, uh, mailers. Uh, and then, like I mentioned earlier, we're doing calls every night uh, as part of our phone banking. Uh, we're doing the calls actually in seven different languages. Um, uh, and Spanish is one of them, but we're also doing calls to voters in Hmong, Punjabi, uh, uh, in Mandarin, uh, Tagalog, uh, Spanish, uh, English, and Vietnamese. Uh, so uh, every night we're having calls with voters uh, from with trusted messengers from their communities. Um, some of the challenges are how do we get to voters that we can't get to them on the phones, that we can't get to them through a mailer because they moved. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's where we have some of the gaps that are missing. But I know a number of local groups uh, like Inner City Struggle, Community Coalition, uh, they're gonna, they're, they've been doing phone banking and running GOTV programs in the community uh, to make sure we're getting the word out. Um, uh, but, and, and so we're gonna need the help of all of you as trusted messengers uh, to get the word out on this issue uh, so that voters know, right, that homeowners are, are fully protected under our measure and would not be impacted. Carmelita, thanks for asking that question. It, it, we learned with the census, we learned with get out, even registering to vote that, you know, the unique role that you all play as nonprofit leaders working in the neighborhoods is key, right? They trust you. And um, this is such a great opportunity to make sure that they get the straight scoop. Um, thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Julio. Um, I think, Aaron, are we, um, is, unless there's any final thoughts, um, I'm really grateful that we had this chance to talk together and answer some questions, get some clarity, and um, hopefully get energized about the next couple of days and then what comes next, next year. Absolutely. Um, yeah, thank you all for joining us. I actually just got a text message too that my ballot was just counted, which was like perfectly timed. Um, so that's <laughs> one more vote for each of these measures. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Julio and Veronica, for taking the time. Um, really appreciate it. And we'll be sharing uh, the video of this call for, for others to see as well. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining and hope you have a good uh, weekend and stay sane in these last uh, couple of weeks before the election. Great, thank you so much. Bye, thank you everyone. Thank you.